Well, thanks for all coming along today, um, and thanks for the invitation to, to come to Adelaide and, and talk. Uh, the work I'm going to be talking about is focused on the Antarctic climate records that we've been working on, and, and this is work that I started while I was at the British Antarctic Survey, and then it's continued on in collaboration um, with my colleagues there um, since I've moved to the Australian National University. Um, right, so the, the talk is going to be focused on work that's come out of an ice core that we collected from James Ross Island. And this is a, this is a photo of our camp on James Ross Island. So um, at the start of 2008, uh, there were seven of us went to this site. Um, these were our living areas um, and our working areas over here. So we lived on, on top of this ice cap for um, around about two months. But first of all, to start out off with a bit of background for James Ross Island. So James Ross Island is right um, here, very close to the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, and um, I'm going to come back to the, the reason why we wanted to look at the climate here. But first of all, a little bit of history. So it's um, one of the, the earliest exploration areas for Antarctica. The, the island gets its name from um, the explorer James Clark Ross, who visited the area in 1842 and 1843. Um, this is a sketch that was made on that voyage. So the ships here are the Terebus and the, and the Erebus and Terra, sorry. And this is Cockburn Island here. This is the edge of James Ross Island here. And the significant thing about this image is this lump of ice here. So at the time that James Clark Ross visited this area, James Ross Island wasn't an island that could be sailed all around. There was an ice shelf that was connecting um, the island to the main Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, so it's, um, James Ross Island also gets a mention in the diary of Shackleton during the, the famous endurance expedition. Uh, and and the, the mention in that diary um, is written when the, that expedition were out um, on the, the sea ice in the, in the Weddell Sea over here. And, and they talk about um, Mount Haddington, which is the, the top of James Ross Island, uh, fading into the distance. And, and um, that represented the, the time in that um, expedition where they'd lost all hope of actually being able to get to the Antarctic continent. So up until that point, their plan had been to try and get to James Ross Island, get across to the other side of the Antarctic Peninsula to the whaling stations where they could be rescued. Um, so at that point in the diary, this is where they've lost hope of that being able to, ha to, to happen. And so, and then um, history went on. So they, they ended up at Elephant Island and then managing to get across um, to the whaling st station at South Georgia. So, the, so again, at the time that um, Shackleton was going past, James Ross Island was connected to the peninsula. So if they'd been able to get to the island, they then would have been able to, I think I've lost, oh, there it is. Um, to get across the peninsula and get to, to help on the western side of the peninsula. Now, that's not the case anymore. So James Ross Island, you can now sail right around, and that was actually quite helpful when we went there because the ship could get a lot closer to, for being able to um, helicopter us up onto the island. Um, but since 1995, there's been a series of collapses of ice shelves along the Antarctic Peninsula. So we've had the Prince Gustav ice shelf, the Larsen A ice shelf, which both collapsed in 1995, and then probably more famously was the Larsen B ice shelf collapse, which happened in 2002. Um, and those ice shelves are still um, now areas of, of open water. They, they aren't areas where ice is reformed. Um, and the reason that the Larsen B collapse was so famous was that it was actually captured by satellite images. So the new, newly launched MODA satellite was actually able to take a series of images showing what happens when an ice shelf collapses. And so on this image here, we can see the Larsen B ice shelf um, in January of 2002. Um, and these black dots on here are melt ponds that had formed on top of that ice shelf. And then five weeks later, the ice shelf has completely collapsed. And er pretty much everywhere where there'd been this extensive surface melting that weakened the ice shelf, um, that's, that ice, that's where the ice shelf then collapsed. And that's a process that we're now seeing happening in other ice shelves along the Antarctic Peninsula. So from those very visual images of um, environmental change, it's, um, it, it's quite um, easy to then go and say, well, this is a visual example of climate change happening before our eyes. But we, we need a bit more evidence 
um, to go and back up those statements and to, to show whether this is something that's unusual or is this just something that naturally happens um, with the ice around Antarctica. And if we go and look at um, our temperature records um, since 1958, and I've chosen 1958 here because that's when Antarctica started to have good observational records, um, we can see that this is an area, where am I going? I'm losing my pointer. There it is. Um, this is an area where we have had rapid warming. So um, the question is, um, has this um, warming of the air temperature contributed to the collapse and the loss of these ice shelves? So that's where the James Ross Island project came from. And the questions that we went out to, to try and answer by drilling an ice core from this area, um, and before this ice core, there weren't any long ice core records from the Antarctic Peninsula. All of our information came from the main Antarctic continent. So the, the question we wanted to know was, how unusual is the warming that we're seeing on the Antarctic Peninsula at the moment? Um, and are the ice shelf collapses that have happened over the past few decades related to climate change, um, to that, those, the warming of the air temperature? And how does the Antarctic Peninsula compare to mainland Antarctica? So they were, the, they were the questions we went out to, to answer, and I think that we have answered those, um, and probably answered a few more than what we expected as well. So as science goes, the, um, the project develops as you start to see, see the data and, and put the pieces together. Um, so before I go into the science, I thought it would actually be nice to show you a bit about what's involved in collecting an ice core, because it's pretty cool, actually. Um, so I'll just get onto my video. Sorry, my computer is spinning up. There we go. So, so this is um, the project. Um, so this is how we got to the site. We, we went in by um, a British Navy ship, HMS Endurance. Um, and we went in that way because the Endurance has these two, or had these two linked helicopters operating off the back, and that's how we got the seven people who were working on the island and also the eight tons of equipment that we had to take with us up onto the island, and then got all of the people and all the equipment back out at the end of the season. This is the first helicopter coming in. Um, this is one of the, the living tents that's too long to fit actually inside the helicopter, so it goes through the doors. And what you'll see in a moment is um, the, the helicopter's going and leaving the, the first two people who were at the site. And, and what they're left with is just the, their basic survival equipment. So they've got a radio box, they've got some food, they've got a tent and some warm clothes, and, and that's it. Uh, so, so if at this point the helicopters end up, the, the weather closes in and the helicopters can't get back, they've got enough basics to be able to survive until um, people can get to them again. And then this here, the, the drum, is marking the depot that was put in the year before with more of the equipment. So here we have more equipment coming in. So a lot of the equipment came in in these big underslung loads, particularly things like the generator, um, the skidoo, and those sorts of things that we needed. Um, so that process it took about um, 10 days to get all the people and all the equipment into camp. And then the helicopters flew off and the ship went and went away to do work in another part of the peninsula. So at that point, we were just seven of us on the ice cap, self-sufficient. Uh, so the weather <laughs> wasn't always great. It wasn't as bad as we'd been told James Ross Island would be, um, but we did get some weather like this. Uh, once we were set up, then we had all of our work areas and all of our living areas in tents, so we weren't stopped by the weather being bad. Uh, but basically, the, the first two weeks was a lot of building. So this is our drill tent being set up. You can see the big um, planks of wood that are there as the foundation for the floor of the drilling tent. This is the, the floor going into place now. Um, and then there was a big weather haven tent put on top of that and then all of the equipment brought in. Um, this is our generator just getting a shed so it didn't get um, completely covered by snow. Now 
now we have the, the drilling equipment all set up. You can see there's been a lot of building, um, a lot of um, engineering to get all that equipment together and into a functioning unit. Uh, so this is the, the drill going down the hole. Every time that the drill went down the hole, um, it could drill between a metre and a metre and a half of ice. Uh, so we then pull the, the ice core, the, the drill back up to the surface, take out the ice, put the drill back together, put it back down the hole, drill the next metre, metre and a half of ice, um, and repeat that process over and over again. Um, in this case, we repeated it until we got down to 364 metres. Um, and, and, and at that point we stopped because we'd hit the rock at the bottom of the, of the ice cap. So we drilled all the way through the ice cap and got the complete climate history from this, this site. So as we're drilling down through the, the ice, what we're doing is going back further and further in time and drilling through layers of snow that fell um, um, many years ago. And the bottom of this ice core we estimate to be about 50,000 years old. Um, and, and that's that old ice is um, ice that is still being worked on and developing the climate record from it. So this is the ice core coming out now. Uh, so in this project, uh, we drilled the ice core in the field, but we didn't do any of the analysis in the field. So we then um, cut the ice core into sections that would fit into our transport boxes, the insulated boxes. Um, the ice core was then um, put down into a snow pit to keep it frozen. Um, and then we had planes from the British Antarctic Survey come in and transport the ice back to their main research station, Rothera, which is on the western side of the Antarctic Peninsula. It was put in the freezers there, and then at the end of the summer season it went into the freezers on the British Antarctic Survey ships um, and sailed back to the UK where we worked on it in the laboratories. So from drilling the ice core, um, it then took about six months to get the ice back to the laboratories to work on it, um, and then about five years to actually do the, the analysis and start to get the, the scientific results coming out of the project. So once we, once we have the, the ice core and we've done the analysis on it, the, one of the hardest things to do with an ice core is actually to figure out how old the ice is. Um, so we can't use the traditional sort of um, geochemical um, methods, so there's, there's no carbon in there to be able to radiocarbon date the ice core. Um, there's nothing like uranium thorium or anything to be able to do those geochemical um, analysis to, to get the dates. Um, so, so the way that we developed um, the chronology was to first of all start off with um, a, an ice sheet model. Um, and, and that just takes into account the, the temperature of the site, um, how thick the ice is and how much snowfall you get each year. And, and using those parameters you can have a, have a rough guess at what your um, age profile for the ice might be. Um, the other thing that has to get taken into account um, with developing this, this um, depth age profile is that um, the ice undergoes a, a, no, a number of sort of um, transformations. Um, so first of all we have the, the snow falling as snow and then that's compacted into ice. So our layers get um, thinner because we, we change from being snow where there's a lot of air in between the particles to, to being ice where we've got some bubbles locked in. Um, but we're, we're a, a lot, um, we've got a much greater density than, than snow. Um, so that's one of the things that goes on. But the other thing that goes on is that the, the ice isn't static. So even though it, it's difficult to, to see, um, the ice is continually flowing. And so we have this lateral thinning of the layers as well. So we have ice that's falling over a dome and that's gradually getting covered by more snow falling on top. But at the same time, the ice is flowing away from that dome and down towards the coast where it will eventually break up as icebergs, um, flow down glaciers, become ice shelves, um, all those processes that happen um, around the coast. And so well, that, that's another process that means that our layers are actually getting thinner as we go back further in time. So that's why we get um, an age profile. No, I've lost myself again. No. That's why we get an age profile where we have a, a really a lot of detailed information in the top of the core. So if we look at just the last 2,000 years of information, 
um, where that takes us down to about um, 320 metres or so of that 364 metres of ice. And then the, the rest of that 40 metres or so of ice contains the rest of up to, back to what we think is about 50,000 years. So, so we get, as we go further down in the ice core, um, we get less detail, but we get a lot more information, a lot, lot more time in, in each metre of ice. So the other thing that we did with this ice core, and we were quite lucky in this site um, to be able to tie down the chronology, um, was to, to look at um, volcanic tephra ash layers that we could actually see in the ice core. And, and because the Antarctic Peninsula has a number of volcanoes um, along it, um, and James Ross Island is an ancient volcano itself, um, then we, we had a number of layers which have independently been dated in lake records which we could then tie on and that, those are the black dots that we see in there that we use to refine our age model. So then our, our isotope profile. Um, this is what we, what we get. So just to give you a big a broad overview, so this is probably 50,000 years ago. We do have an unconformity in the ice core, so we miss part of the, the glacial, interglacial transition. Um, that unconformity happens in the bottom of five metres of the ice, and there's a, a shear there. Um, so we've probably drilled into a hollow where the ice is sort of shearing along the top. Um, but that's all very, um, very um, can, um, tight at the bottom of the ice core. So the, what I'm going to focus on, though, um, is more of what's happening in this top section, and particularly uh, I'm going to focus a lot on the last 2,000 and 1,000 years where we have a really a lot of climate information. So, so this um, record at the top is the deuterium isotope ratio. So that's the, the ratio of heavy to light um, hydrogen molecules that are making up the, the water that originally fell as snow and is now um, transformed into to ice. Um, and that has, that has a linear relationship with temperature. So if we have a, a warmer climate, then we have more energy to be able to move the heavy isotope through the water cycle and we get more of the heavy isotope making it to Antarctica and falling as snow. At James Ross Island we were lucky because firstly there are, um, on the Antarctic Peninsula there's um, quite a lot of research stations and so we have nearby observations of temperature um, and so here we're showing Esperanza station um, in black. Um, compared to our isotope record in green. And the, the, that linear relationship that we get is a, a 6.4 per mil change in the deuterium isotope ratio for every degree of temperature change. And the really satisfying thing about this is that it corresponds really very nicely to the spatial relationship. So if we go and look at the surface of Antarctica and we measure the um, deuterium isotope ratio of the surface snow and we compare that to um, the present day mean temperature, we get a very similar relationship, so a 6.34 um, dependence. So, so really nice that that spatial calibration matches what we get as a temporal one as well. Right, so in green is our record from James Ross Island, um, and the red and the purple curves um, are showing similar records that, are gotten, that have been obtained from the East Antarctic ice sheet, so the main part of the Antarctic continent. So there's a lot of similarities. They both show this early Holocene climate optimum uh, and then a fairly sort of stable mid-Holocene climate. But on the Antarctic Peninsula, we get this very pronounced um, decrease in temperature and then e increase um, again in the last 2,000 years. And where that becomes really interesting is if we go and compare that to um, what was going on with the ice shelves around James Ross Island, um, so when these ice shelves collapsed in 1995 and again in 2002, um, ships went in straight away and sampled the sediments that had been below those ice shelves. And by looking at um, the, the diatom assemblages in those sediment cores and also looking at the, the rock grains to see where the icebergs had been coming from, um, they were able to, to show that um, there was open water in these areas so that the ice shelves weren't permanent features during the mid-Holocene. It was only around about 2,000 years ago that those ice shelves actually became a permanent feature. And that ties in really quite nicely with our record from James Ross Island. So where we have 
these temperatures in the mid Holocene, which are fairly similar to present day. So the dotted line is our 1961 to 1990 mean. Um, so fairly similar to present day, ice shelves weren't a permanent feature. And they're really a very recent feature that formed during this cool anomaly here and have now collapsed now that our temperature is back into this equivalent to the, the mid Holocene. The other thing that we can do is to, to look at that um, temperature record. First of all, to compare it with quite an iconic record of temperature change um, in the Northern Hemisphere, largely based on tree rings from the, the Northern Hemisphere, and looking at things like this little ice age signal. There we go. Um, so this little ice age here. And, and previous work on the Antarctic Peninsula had shown that there'd been a cold interval and that had been tied to the little ice age. But having the, the, the much better resolution and age control that we have on the James Ross Island ice core, we can show that actually the coolest period of time probably predated the Little Ice Age in the Northern Hemisphere, and our coolest time was around about 600 years ago. The other thing that we can do is to look at the recent warming and to say something statistical about how unusual the recent warming is. And we did that by taking this the, the last 2,000 years of the ice core record um, and we looked at every 100 years and calculated the temperature trend over that 100 years and then we stepped out window by another year and calculated the temperature trend again. And so that gives us a distribution of um, past 100 year long temperature trends um, over the last 2,000 years. And then if we look at our most recent um, 100 years, we see that while we're not completely unprecedented, we're, what we're seeing now is really very unusual in the context of the last 2,000 years. And if we want to give a statistical um, number to it, we're in the upper 0.3% of all of the century-long temperature trends over the last 2,000 years. So not unprecedented, but really quite unusual in how fast the climate is warming there. So I've already talked about one of the impacts that that has had, so we, and that, that was what we went out to, to go and look for, um, was to see um, how climate related to changes in ice shelf history along the Antarctic Peninsula. But it's not the only environmental impact that we can look at, and this was really quite a surprising part of the project, so something that we hadn't anticipated was when we started to drill this ice core and pull the, those bits of ice core out of the, the core barrel, we saw these, um, these visible layers here of bubble-free ice. And what they represent is where there's been summer melting, um, that, where the snow has melted and then refrozen, and, so, and when it refreezes, it freezes without um, the, the gas bubbles inside it. And while we were in the field, we, uh, that was a process that we could actually see happening. So this was our um, ice core storage pit. And over the, the course of the summer, we saw these melt layers forming in the walls of this pit um, on the, the, the very warm days. Um, so, so these are the, the melt layers from the summer that we were on James Ross Island, and these are the melt layers from the summer of 1800 to 1801 as an example from the, the ice core. So um, one of my co-authors describes um, James Ross Island as being a Goldilocks site, and it was something we, we weren't expecting, but what we ended up with at this site was a site that was not so cold that the summer temperature never goes above zero and you never get ice melt. And for a lot of Antarctica and for pretty much every other place where we've collected ice cores, that's the case. So the, the, the climate, particularly over the, the East Antarctic ice sheet, um, is that the summer temperatures are still well below the melting point and so you don't ever have summer melting preserved in the ice core. There's one other record of ice melt from Antarctica. It comes from Seipel Dome, so this area over here. And in that ice core in the 12,000 years of climate record, I think it was 62 events that they, they were able to, to measure. So they get a little bit of melting, but not very much. Whereas on James Ross Island, up here, uh, I'm sorry, up there, um, the summer temperatures are close enough to zero that every year we get some melting. And what we could do with the ice core was go and measure how much of the, the annual snowfall had melted each year to, to get an indication as to um, how the intensity of melt had changed over the last 1,000 years. And we only took this analysis back 1,000 years because, because of the thinning 
of the ice. Once we got um, down to 1,000 years into the ice core, we weren't sure that we wouldn't miss melt layers because of the, the layers becoming thin. So, so we stopped the analysis at the 1,000 year point, even though we can see melt layers below, further, deeper down in the ice core. Um, so quantifying, I should just say, sorry, this image that I was showing here um, is a satellite image of surface um, ice melt, so for snow melt over Antarctica, um, that's um, taken from backscatter satellite measurements. Um, so you can see that the, the main places where you get melting in the summer are along the, the coastal areas and particularly along the Antarctic Peninsula. And we used this satellite image, to, this satellite information to go in and get some information for the James Ross Island site, which, um, so in red is our record of melt percent, and your melt percent. Um, this green one over here, where's it come there? There we go. This green one over here is the satellite record, so we don't have very much overlap, but the overlap we have looks good. Um, and then in black is, um, again, using the Esperanza station record and looking at the daily temperatures. And the factor that's important for summer ice melt um, is something called the positive degree day um, index. Well, yeah, uh, um, positive degree days. And what that is, it takes the, the sum of all the temperatures that are above zero and, and, and puts them together, um, calculates them together for, for each year. Um, so that's giving an indication, not just of the number of days where the temperature is above zero, but how far above zero, so how much energy we've got available for melting. Um, at Esperanza, the daily data isn't as good as the, the monthly average data, so the, there's a lot of missing data, and that's why you see that this isn't a continuous plot over here. So we, we only used years where we had, I can't remember quite what our cutoff was, but it was around about 70% um, of the days in summer actually had observations made. Uh, but the other thing that we, we could do, which is less dependent on making sure that we have data for every single day, was to go in and just calculate the, the average of the temperatures that were above zero. It's not as precise a measure of how much energy there was available for melting, but it gives us more of a continuous record. And that's what's shown in the bottom, which is then um, giving us a fair bit of confidence that we are recording in these melt layers something that's meaningful in terms of the summer temperatures. So this is, this is our record. In green is the temperature record that I showed before. And then in red um, is the, the ice melt record. And just to put some numbers on the changes that we're seeing, so from this coldest period um, in the last 1,000 years, um, around 1410 to 1460 AD, uh, the temperature at James Ross Island was around about 1.6 degrees cooler than what it currently is. Um, and so that doesn't sound like um, a massive change. Um, it's a decent change, but it's, it's not huge, um, over 600 years. Uh, but what it has caused is a 10% increase in the amount of summer melting that we're getting at this site. So back in this coldest period, um, where are you? No, it's, it is, oh, there we go. <laughs> um, in this coldest period, um, around about half a percent of our annual snowfall melted and refroze at James Ross Island. It's now almost 5% of the summer snowfall that melts and refreezes. And the really striking thing about this image um, is the, the non-linear relationship that we see here. So this really dramatic spike in the amount of summer melting that we're getting um, over the last 50 years or so. And we can um, explain that. And it really, I think, summer ice melt is a really neat example of how um, the responses to climate changes aren't necessarily linear. Um, and the, the reason for that is because of this positive degree day index. So if we have a, a place like the Antarctic Peninsula where summer temperatures um, are approaching zero degrees, then even a small, a small climate shift will increase the number of days that go above zero degrees but it'll also the days that we're already going above zero will go above by even more. And so if we think about that in terms of the amount of energy above that threshold that's available for causing melting, uh, we can, and we can simulate this by, again, using the Esperanza station data, uh, we can see there's this exponential relationship between mean summer temperature um, and the energy available for causing ice melt. 
So what that's telling us is that because the Antarctic Peninsula, the summer temperatures are already close to zero, or if not above zero sometimes, then this is a really vulnerable part of the climate system in terms of ice melt because even a small amount of further temperature increase can have a large impact on the amount of summer ice melt. So the last thing I wanted to, to look at was to then go into looking at the climate processes. So we've shown that the temperature um, change is unusually rapid um, and that's having a marked impact and this non-linear um, effect on accelerating um, summer ice melt. But why is the climate warming so, so rapidly? Um, and, uh, and I think the thing that puts this into context is so why this is a really interesting scientific question because we know the, the world is warming but it's not warming the same everywhere. Um, and in particular, um, based on, on, on this reconstruction of continental scale temperature reconstructions for the last 2,000 years, uh, which this was published last year, um, in that study it was found that every continent shows um, a recent reversal of a long-term cooling trend into um, now warming apart from Antarctica. So the main Antarctic continent bucks that trend and actually isn't showing evidence of significant widespread warming. So that really makes it quite interesting if we've got the Antarctic Peninsula that's warming exceptionally quickly, but large parts of Antarctica aren't. And what that does is to sort of start to make us think about um, the southern annular mode. And I've shown this plot here, which is a correlation between the southern annular mode and surface air temperature. And you can see this really marked difference between what's happening on the Antarctic continent and what happens um, on the Antarctic Peninsula and South America in response to a change in the southern annular mode. So I need to tell you a bit about what the southern annular mode actually is. So it's defined as the leading mode of variability in the southern hemisphere, of sea level pressure variability in the southern hemisphere. But probably a, a, a cleaner way to think about it um, and, a, and a way that you can define a SAM index is to look at what the average um, atmospheric pressure is, mean sea level pressure is at 40 de degrees south and look at what it is at 65 degrees south and, and look at the difference between those two um, latitude bands. Um, and if that difference is larger, um, then we have a, a positive phase of our southern annular mode. If it gets smaller, then we have a, a negative phase. So that's the, the scientific ex example, but there's a dog that can do it much better than me, so I'm going to, if I can, oops, that's not what I wanted to do, but it's gone back to science again. Okay, there we go. Meet Sam. Sam herds coal fronts up from the Southern Ocean, a significant source of rain for Southern Victoria. If we take a look at the Southern Ocean, we can see westerly winds circling around Antarctica, throwing out coal fronts of stormy wet weather. The strength and position of these winds is known as the Southern Annular Mode, or SAM. Sam is an unreliable climate dog, often changing his behaviour in a matter of weeks, which can affect Victoria's rainfall. But when Sam is tied up, strong winds are pulled in towards Antarctica, and there is a reduction in the number and strength of cold fronts that reach southern Australia. When Sam is let off the leash, the westerly winds move further north, increasing the chance of frontal activity and potential rainfall. Over recent decades, Sam has found himself tied up more often, resulting in less cold fronts and rainfall for some parts of Victoria. Sam's behaviour is complicated, so scientists are in full swing to try to understand how this climate dog might impact on Victoria's weather down the track. So that's just one of a set of climate dog videos um, put together by the Victorian Department of Primary Industries and there's a, a set that's been adapted for New South Wales as well. I don't know if there's a set for South Australia. Um, but anyway, they're, they're a really neat sort of tool just to explain and they're designed for when farmers get a, a rainfall forecast saying 
you can probably expect less rainfall because El Nino is developing in the Pacific Ocean. The climate dog explains them what El Nino is and why <coughs> El Nino means they'll get less rainfall, or in this case, the southern annular mode. So, so in that video, they mentioned that there's been a trend over recent years for the, the winds to be tied closer to Antarctica. Um, and that's what, what is shown in this record here. So this is um, our observational record of the southern annular mode. Um, it starts in 1958 because that's when the Antarctic um, stations after the International Geophysical Year started to routinely record um, climate observations around the, the continent. And so these are the, the set of Antarctic stations and then the set of mid-latitude stations that are used to look at the pressure difference and reconstruct a SAM index. Now, um, a lot of work has gone into looking at this change in, in the SAM, um, and it's widely been attributed to um, the ozone hole over Antarctica, which has caused the winds to, to pull in tighter around Antarctica. But what, you, what we can't really tell from this record um, is the bigger picture, because we've only got a record since 1958. So really putting this recent change into perspective and understanding why the southern annular mode is changing um, is difficult when our observations are, um, are only this long. Um, and just one other little image, just to, to just give you another example of what it looks like um, when we have a negative phase of the SAM or a positive phase of the SAM. Uh, so this is a, a, these are maps from this year um, of different days and looking at the, the power, the wind power in the Southern Ocean. There we go. No. There we go. Um, and so this is an example of a negative phase. So the, the winds are very disorganized. They're, um, they move out a long way into the low latitudes. And you can see at those points in Australia, it becomes in the path of the westerly winds. This is, is an example of when the SAM is in a positive phase. So those winds become much stronger and tighter and much more organized, just blowing in a much more regular way around Antarctica. So that's the trend that we've been seeing in recent decades. And when the winds are like this, then the cold fronts don't make it up as far as Australia. We miss out on rain. And this is particularly significant for the southwestern corner of Western Australia, where the cold fronts coming out of the Southern Ocean are pretty much their only source of winter rainfall. So going back to the climate records, um, so we've got the correlation of what the, we've got the, the, the spatial picture of what SAM does to temperature. Um, and then over on the, the left-hand side here, these are those um, last 2,000 year reconstructions. In red is the reconstruction for South America. In blue is the reconstruction for Antarctica, which didn't include James Ross Island. Um, because it didn't match. <laughs> um, and then in green is our James, James Ross Island record. Um, and if you look at those, and statistically there is a, an inverse relationship between what's happening in Antarctica and what's happening on James Ross Island. And you can even see that in that multi-decadal variability that um, when it gets cooler on James Ross Island, the Antarctic um, continent seems to have a warm phase. Um, and then you can also see that it's quite sort of striking that James Ross Island temperature history looks to be a lot more alike to South America than what it does to Antarctica. And uh, the crosses on this plot just show where all the individual records came from to make up those reconstructions. So what we then did was to go and uh, put all of these individual climate records together and see if we could produce uh, um, a, a history of what the southern annular mode has been doing for the last 1,000 years. I won't go into the, the methods, but if anyone wants to ask me the gory details about the methods, I'll, I'm happy to talk about that later. But this is the reconstruction um, that we get. Uh, so in, um, in grey and black is our reconstruction from the proxy records. Um, you can just see at the end is in orange is the observational record that I showed before. Uh, in purple is another observational record, but that's based only on mid-latitude stations, um, so it doesn't have the Antarctic information in there as well. Uh, and then the, the blue line here, the solid line, is just showing that statistically we're doing better than if we just had um, a network of noise, um, that we're, we're doing a better job at reconstructing the SAM than, than noise, so that's, that's good. Um, right. 
So, so that's our, our reconstruction. Um, the key things here is that it looks like the most negative phase of the SAM is when we had that cold phase on James Ross Island, so about 1400 AD. Uh, we've got two phases of significant positive trends. So we've got a long-term um, positive trend in the 1500s to um, 1700s. And then this most recent positive trend here. And the, the long-term mean value of the SAM is at its most positive um, value um, over the, the last 1,000 years. So we can, we can do a bit more than this as well. Um, and that's thanks to the... IPCC and the, the climate modelling community who, ahead of the late, latest IPCC report, ran a set of standardised climate experiments. And one of the experiments that they did is really handy for us for looking at um, what's going on over the last 1,000 years, and that's these last millennium simulations. So the, running the climate model over a full 1,000 years is quite demanding. So, in, so the full 50, set of 50 models that were involved in the um, CMIP-5 in the comparison project didn't run those experiments, but there were eight models that did run them. And that's shown here in the red curve here, um, is the, the ensemble mean of those eight models pulling out the SAM index in those models. And then in red is the climate, the transient climate forcing that those models were forced with. So showing um, orbital forcing, um, we've got the greenhouse gases here, um, there's a solar variability in there, um, and then these downward spikes here are the rapid um, volcanic events. Um, so we can, we can go and look at these records and, and try and put a statistical number on when the recent positive trend um, in the SAM became significant, and the number that we get is 1940. So that's quite significant because it tells us that the SAM has been increasing for longer than we've been putting um, CFCs into the atmosphere. So we can't blame this ch increase in the SAM just on the ozone hole. And then if we look at the, the climate models, they also produce this same shift um, at about 1940. So, so we get a really quite a good agreement um, in the 20th century between what the climate models say SAM was doing and what we get from our proxy records. Uh, we get less agreement in this um, part, and I'll come back to that in a moment. The other thing that we, we did was to use um, Stephen Phipps's model runs where he um, ran these last millennium simulations, but instead of throwing all of the climate forcing at it at once, he put the forcing in um, one at a time and ran the model again each time. So if we look just at what the model does, what the model SAM does with just orbital forcing, and that gives us our range of unforced natural variability of the system, um, that's what is shown in the blue curve, and this is the dotted lines give that uh, the two sigma range of natural variability. Uh, and then if we add greenhouse gases, then we see that in the early 20th century, the SAM increases, and it, it increases outside of the bounds of natural variability. So we have a really quite convincing argument that greenhouse gases are responsible for the recent change in the SAM. Um, and then if we look at solar, we start to get a hint that we may have this also have a cause for this long-term increase in, in the SAM during the 15, 1500s to 1700s. Uh, but it, it doesn't fall outside of the range of natural variability and it isn't a significant trend if we compare it to the range of unforced trends in the model. Um, it certainly isn't a, as prominent as what we get in our proxy records. So there's a couple of things that may be going on here. Uh, one of them is that the models may not have the, solar for the magnitude of solar forcing correct. Uh, so this, this is a curve here showing lots of different estimates for solar forcing. So the, the last millennium experiments were run using one of these curves from the top. Um, Stephen Phipps's model uses this, the blue SBF forcing. But after those model, um, those experiments were already well underway, um, another study came out recalibrating the solar cycle and suggesting that perhaps we've grossly underestimated the range of solar changes in the past. So that's something that still needs to be tested and it, um, to, to try and figure out if we have underestimated the solar changes and could that be why the models don't tend to be producing the range of variability that we see from the proxies before um, the, the last century. 
Um, another possibility is that we could be looking at changes in the southern annular mode that aren't forced by these radiative mechanisms. And a, a key candidate to look at for that is El Nino, because in the present day climate there is um, a significant correlation between what El Nino is doing in the tropical, tropical Pacific and what the westerly winds are doing around Antarctica. Um, so if we have an El Nino in the tropical Pacific, we tend to have a negative um, phase of the SAM. And that is particularly strong um, in the Antarctic Peninsula area. Uh, so, so and there, there is some evidence to suggest that this could be what was going on and, and what was forcing those long-term changes in the SAM. Uh, so again, black is our reconstruction, green is a James Ross Island temperature record. Um, and then in red here is a reconstruction of Nino 3.4 sea surface temperatures. Um, this was produced last year. I'm sorry, I don't have the reference up there, but if anyone wants it, let me know. Um, and, and we do see this agreement. So whereas um, we have so the, the warmest Nino 3.4 sea surface temperatures in the pre-anthropogenic period um, at around about the 1400s, so matching quite nicely with our minimum in the SAM, our negative SAM phase. And then we have this trend towards cooler Nino 3.4 sea surface temperatures that matches quite nicely the trends we see in SAM and again a reversal of those trends. So, so this is another possibility for what might have been forcing those changes and, and perhaps why climate models aren't picking up um, those changes in their um, forced climate experiments. So just to wrap it up, just a couple of take home messages. So I've separated these out into two things. So what can we say about temperature um, on the Antarctic Peninsula? We can say that it's warming unusually fast. It's not unprecedented, but it's really quite unusual. Uh, the positive SAM trends have caused the Antarctic Peninsula to warm. Um, have, so the Antarctic Peninsula warming over the last 600 years is because the southern annular mode has been becoming increasingly positive in its phase. Um, the SAM is now at its most positive phase for the last millennium. And at least the, the trends in the 20th century we can quite convincingly attribute to greenhouse forcing and then later ozone depletion. And the impact that this is ha ha having. Um, so we can see that at similar temperatures today, to today, ice shells weren't permanent features in the James Ross area, Island area. So. Um, the long-term warming probably meant that these ice shelves were poised for the collapses that we've seen recently. Um, we've had a tenfold increase in the amount of summer ice melt, most of that in the last century. Um, and the Antarctic Peninsula is now warmed to a level where e even a small amount of further increase is likely to have a large impact on the amount of summer ice melt. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.